the right field line. Pretty well hit. Lafarn way. It's the right way here tonight. Yogi Berra said it's 90% mental. The other half is physical. My name is Ryan Lavarnway, Major League Catcher and Minor League Grinder, and I've spent the last 15 years playing professional baseball while evolving my mindset. I'm fascinated by optimizing that 90%. In this show, I'll talk to elite athletes and mindset coaches about what makes them tick and how they've overcome obstacles in their own careers on the way to finding success. This is Finding the Way. Hey guys, welcome to Finding the Way. I am Ryan Lavarnway, and today I am joined by Matt Smith. Not just any Matt Smith. Matthew, James, Patrick, Smith, there are about, you know what, I I googled this, Matt, when I was doing my research on you, because I I ended up down a rabbit hole trying to find the correct Matt Smith, and did you know that you are joining me from from London right now, Uh, but in America, the Census Bureau says there are 2,600,000 last name Smiths in the country and and over 18,000 Matts. So I'm glad we found the yeah. right one. There's a few. There's a few. And there's a few <laughs> in professional football now as well. Uh, my funny Matt Smith story is that when I was playing for a team called QPR, I was leaving to sign for another team called Millwall. And on the day that I left, they signed another Matt Smith. So I gave him my name tag on my locker and said, here, you can have this one. I think it will work. And he burst into burst into laughter so yeah there's a couple of matt smiths in professional football i'm the oldest one uh but there's a couple of young matt smiths knocking around so yeah well done for finding me yeah a couple of young whippersnappers that's amazing one of my actually one of my favorite teammates was josh smith um and he is a right-handed pitcher uh, and there was an also another josh smith that was a left-handed pitcher and they ended up being teammates uh and they had to throw a middle initial in there so that the fans knew who they were talking about um, but that is besides the point. Uh, if you don't know who this particular Matt Smith is, he plays striker for the EFL League Two club Salford City in England, and he has been pro for 15 years. 15 years, yep. I graduated uh, from university when I was 21. Um, so now coming into the sort of the, the twilight years now. Um, and yeah, the kind of just enjoying it for what it's worth. It's the the older pro in the in the locker room. So no, enjoying it and trying to use my experience as best I can. I think now, the the older pro who also was the top goal scorer last year for your team. Uh, first of all, I know what it takes to to have a fifteen year career. I just retired after fifteen years. Congratulations, man, on on being one of the best in the world for a very very long time. Yeah, no, thank you. It's, yeah, a, a, a real privilege. You know, I, I kind of started out not thinking that professional sport was kind of my journey, my route. Um, and then for it, not only just to be, you know, a reality for it to be sustained for a period of time has, has been a real privilege. And I think it's, I'm not really like a particularly nostalgic guy who reflects on things, but I think it's probably one of those when you do retire, you'll think, hang on a sec, that was a good, that had a good innings, you know, for for a number of years and, and really enjoyed it and sort of like absolutely exhausted every ounce of sort of average talent that I might have had and then yeah stretched it out for a, for a long period of time yeah well so so that's a perfect segue into exactly what I like to talk about on this podcast it, it's funny that you call yourself average or your talent level average I think first of all that's probably vastly understating your abilities but what I'd like to talk about on this podcast is what did separate you from the millions uh, of youth athletes, the millions of kids that wanted to play pro soccer for a long time, the, for their entire lives. What separated Matt Smith, who just described himself, his physical abilities as average? What made you different? What was it in your mindset? What was it that you did? Give me, give me a couple of keys and secrets to success for you. I think fundamentally mental strength and hard work i think those are two things you can't really get away from if you're going to succeed and if you're going to succeed for a for a sustained period of time i think as a, a center forward in english football i had an anomaly in the sense that i'm six foot six there's not many six foot six center forwards or footballers in general um you know so i had that one kind of attribute that made me stand out and i really exhausted that element of my game and used it to my fullest ability it meant that i was i'm good at heading i'm good in the air i'm good at attacking crosses and i have an eye for a goal and that's kind of always that one kind of outstanding attribute that i had um 
you know, things that I'm had met or have many, many weaknesses, you know, mobility when you're six foot six is, is never going to be your strong suit. Football is a fast, ferocious game. Um, but I kind of just honed in on my strengths. Um, I had a lot of coaches that always said, remember what your strengths are. You know, don't focus too much on on what your weaknesses. Look to relentlessly improve them as best you can. But remember why you're in the team and what you bring to the team. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. But I think in order to, like I said, to have that sustained element of professional sport, you kind of have to have an unwavering mental strength because ultimately you're going to be faced with a lot of doubt, particularly in my early stages of my career. When you're young, you're inexperienced, you don't have any sort of like credibility in the game or any statistic to back up why you think you should be in the game. That is the period of time when you're going to have to overcome quite a substantial bit of doubt uh, from from outside noise. So just having that mental strength to overcome that um, in and amongst relentless hard work. You know, the best that I've seen are not at the top for a reason. Um, they're there because they work really, really hard. And it might not seem like that from the outside. Like a couple of, like some of the best players, obviously I knew going into the locker room who they were and the career they've had. I would never in a million years have thought, wow, they are outrageously <laughs> hardworking before training, after training, during training. Um, it's not a, it's not a coincidence, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I just want to get a little bit more clarity on when you say mental strength, it sounds like you're talking about confidence. Big part of it. Yeah. Big part of it. Confidence for sure. I think, you know, that ability to bounce back from adversity, you know, you're going to have bad games. It's invariable. You're going to make mistakes and people are going to tell you what they think of you. Ultimately as a professional sportsman, you're a commodity, you know, you're the commodity. Unfortunately, you know, it's quite personal. Um, so having that ability to kind of let it wash off your shoulders, not let it affect you, um, especially the higher you go, you know, the, the crowds playing in front of 30, 40,000 40, people can be really intimidating. Um, if you let them sort of dictate your headspace, it can really alter your game. So be, having the ability to not let it get to you, no, not go too high with the highs, too low with the lows. I think at the start of my career, that was probably the one thing I was very guilty of was if I had a bad performance or we lost or I didn't play particularly well, I would be mute. I'd be silent. You know, friends and family would come to see me. I wouldn't speak to them. I would just lock myself away sort of thing and really let it get me down. Um, I think having the ability to think, right, there's the next games around the corner. You have a week to train. You have a week to get better. You know, it's not the end of the world that you lost a game. It's going to, it will happen for you. Don't keep going. Um, I think that's super important. And one thing I think that comes with a bit of age and a bit of experience is staying a bit more level grounded. Oh my, when you were just, when you were just talking about having a bad game and, and becoming a mute, that reminded me of, of a story when I was in college, I, I went to Yale university, we were playing against Harvard and they creamed us. They just crushed us, and I was embarrassed. I was pissed, and my parents were in town to watch the game, and I didn't even say hi to my parents. I, I got on the bus. I was so pissed, and I look back, and, I, and I'm like, man, that was immature, uh, but it was something that I needed to learn, something that I needed to learn how to handle. Can you think of a particular turning point or a particular learning moment where you learned how to do this? Because dealing with loss, dealing with the pressure, dealing with failure, especially as, as a younger person, and especially when you care a lot, right? You care about your career, you care about the outcome. How did you learn how to overcome that and, and realize that there is a next game or there is a next season if, if it's a, a playoff loss? How, how did you learn and, and what can you share with the audience? Well, firstly, my parents would tell me, come on, we've traveled like three hours to watch you play today. Please speak to us when we're having dinner after after the game. You know, I'd take them out for an Italian and there'd be sometimes I'd just be sat on the, the we'd always go to the same restaurant. I'd just be sat there not saying anything. I think eventually they were like, come on, like you, you can't <laughs> keep doing this. This is ridiculous. But um, no, on a serious level, I think I think a lot of my early years were filled with a lot of imposter syndrome. Like I said, I never thought I was going to be a professional sports person. I come from a university background, which in the UK is nothing like America. There's no draft system. You know, the two are completely misaligned. You know, obviously in the US, your route is college and then pros in the UK. If you go to college, you're not becoming an athlete. You're 
becoming a lawyer or something. Do you know what I mean? It's it's totally different. So me going to university kind of for ninety nine point nine percent of people would shut off any route to professional sports. So I think originally a lot of imposter syndrome don't really think do I am do I fit in here? Is this for me? This is a totally new environment, different environment. So I think the experience element certainly helped. Um, but also I think the fundamental thing was surrounding yourself with the right people. Um, I'd always latch on to more experienced pros in the dressing room and learn off them and speak to them and they would share their experience. And I think over time you kind of felt a bit more comfortable in your own skin. I can totally appreciate at the beginning it is difficult. You know, you've not had any sort of success in the game. You probably got the bitter old pro. I've been a bitter old pro, you know, from time to time, you know, when you think, oh, he's this young lad who's not done anything, he's coming in, he's taken my spot, blah, 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 blah. It happens, you know, obviously I like to think I'm a bit wiser to see the bigger picture, but it, it does happen. So, you know, I have been that young pro where the older one, keeping an older one out of the team, and I'm thinking, God, he's got, you know, the noise of the locker room, and I feel a bit like, Ugh. but it happens. Um I think just surrounding yourself with good people. I think speaking to them on a regular basis, learning, understand, just having a willingness to learn um, and digest. Um, and it comes with time. It comes with time. But I think just having an awareness of how you're acting <clears throat> based off performance is is a starting point. Um, and I think with time, you'll you'll kind of learn how to to navigate the the. The kind of murky water yeah i think i think surrounding yourself with the right people uh that, that's your support system right you have your teammates yeah obviously your family in the sports world you have mentors built in as coaches uh, and in the regular world i think you have to go out of your way to find the right mentors it's people that have been there before that can that can guide you and show you the way something else that you and i have in common is that we changed teams a lot yeah it uh, first of all i can't correctly pronounce all of the cities that you played for in england and i'm not even going to try and embarrass myself but it looks like 14 15 16 different teams i also played you know i wore 28 different uniforms in my in my baseball career something that i found was the more different teams that i played for i ended up becoming more valuable because i had played with different playing styles before and as one of the veteran players I found that I could relate to the younger players and I could help them in a way where I was like, oh, I've seen a player like you before, especially as a catcher catching young pitchers, right? You throw kind of like Clay Buckholtz or you throw kind of like John Lester. I've seen this repertoire before and I know how to utilize it to, to its maximum. Um, what difficulties did you find and what benefits did you find from changing teams so often uh, and in needing to build trust with a, with a new group and make new first impressions over and over and over again. Yeah, I think the the main difficulty I probably found was the number of different managers or coaches I had over the years. Um, obviously, like I said at the beginning, I've got quite a unique playing style, or very unique playing style, which is quite Marmite. You can kind of love it or hate it. Like it can bring a lot of um, advantages for your teams but that, that are playing, but very obvious disadvantages. Um, so kind of having to deal with a load of different opinions over the years has been has been tricky. It's, I've had my success with it, but also I've had some hard times with it. Um, and I found myself out of the team for prolonged periods of time or in the team because, like I said, it can tends to go one way or the other. Um, so that's probably been the obvious kind of difficulty with it. I've been lucky in the sense that I've been based in – I was in London for seven years for three different teams – um, so geographically, one thing that can can hurt players is is moving yeah. your location. You know, I mean, especially if you've got. I, I was single for a lot of my playing career up until my late twenties. But the, um, you know, if you if if you've got no responsibilities as such, it's not as hard, I suppose, to just up and leave. But if you have responsibilities, which people do, you know, to to be moving around is is hard on a family, uh, for sure. I, I luckily I didn't have too much of that um but like you said you can draw on so much experience you know every kind of locker room that i then went into like you said you kind of understand where you fit in and you like you've seen multiple 
versions of the same people that you come into contact with so you kind of know how to deal with them or how to get the best out of them when you're playing with them uh, you know what makes them tick per se um so yeah that probably used to be good so i think a lot of the team that a lot of the moving around was before i made it into the pros when i was playing semi-professionally i moved a lot uh that was predominantly based off my university and my other commitments and stuff like that but i think that gave me a real solid grounding because eventually when i did make it into the program i had been in a lot of different male adult locker rooms you know the the route in england is to play a lot of academy football which is all youth-based football uh, whereas i went into the men's game very very early which i think gave me a real hardening and a real like resilience that probably a lot of the academy players miss out on um because they're kind of just playing in and amongst themselves at a younger age group um so yeah like i said loads of loads of ups and downs different memories different experiences um different parts of london different parts of england so yeah you can you can, <laughs> it's uh, it's all part of the story i suppose is there one particular coach do you call them is it just a coach manager manager, manager. i mean now the, the 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 way football is done in the uk now a lot you get head coaches which is a bit more new school the old school you'd have a manager that was it the manager kind of dominated everything about a football team you know in terms of the recruitment the organization everything whereas nowadays because the management in particularly in english soccer can be a bit of a conveyor belt clubs don't want to find themselves sacking managers and then being left with all the ideas and players and style of that particular manager they want to drive their philosophy from the top and then bring in a head coach to you know play out that philosophy if that makes sense so they're not kind of left stuck so the system's kind of changed yeah um to answer your question but yeah head coaches managers okay. the I Same honestly, thing. honestly, I felt a little silly asking if your coach was called a coach, but I'm glad I did because, <laughs> because it wasn't. So has there been a manager or a head coach that has particularly stood out in your mind as, as helping you the most, helping you achieve your potential or be the best version of you? And what was it about that coach uh, that inspired you or helped you be your best? I think my, probably my breakthrough moment in football was signing for Leeds United who are probably one of the biggest football clubs in in England historically anyway um I'd come from a much smaller professional team called Oldham that were uh, in the th- in the third division um and obviously I'd done done quite well and then Leeds signed me that summer and there's a manager called Brian McDermott who was an incredible man um he kind of set me on my way and kind of set me on the path that was kind of upward trajectory from there really and just made me feel great about myself you know i came into leeds a huge club i've gone from playing in front of like i said five six thousand people every week to thirty five thousand people every week which is and you know the the, the expectation uh that that brings the size of the club the history of the club um for instance, I was his first summer signing, um, and I, by my standards, was a small, moderate signing. Um, and he and he would have had every pr- right or prerogative to get a big, big name signing through the door first to sort of set his stall for the summer. You know, we've signed so and so, and I think he had a few signings that were kind of um, on the back burner, so to speak. But he said, "No, nope, I'm getting you in first. Matt's my first signing." um and immediately i just thought wow like you know I'm, I'm not the most impressive signing i'm not overwhelming by any means but i think for him just to show his faith and say nope you're my first i'm signing delighted to have matt on board and like i said come into and remove that kind of element of imposter syndrome straight from the get-go make me feel like i was really valued really wanted. to i think as a player that's probably from your coach that's the one thing you want is you want them to have faith in you but you want to feel valued and I think that's the one thing I've carried through all my career is as long as the manager values what I bring to the team and I'm impacting the team, that's all I can really ask for. Um, but he was probably the one where I kind of went from there to there and he made that gap not feel so daunting or crazy. And, and I imagine feeling better helped you play better. Oh, without a doubt. And I had a great season and it kind of I've stayed at that level for... 10, 11 years after that, after that moment. So I think he was kind of the one that kind of 
made sure I could I could mix it at that at that level probably. That's amazing. You said his name was Brian McDermott. Brian McDermott, yeah, he's a he's a absolute gentleman. Um, I think he went on after the management to do some scouting for Arsenal. Um, last I heard, um, but I get the odd text message. You know, if I do well, I or the odd text message to say well done. I always knew you. Yeah, I always believed in you. Blah blah blah. So that's he's incredible. a he's a great guy. That's incredible. I love that story. It reminds me, you know, and I I want you to be the star of this episode. But that reminds me of. The, the best manager I ever played for in baseball was Terry Francona. And I played for him in my first year with Major League Time and my last year with Major League Time, 12 years apart for different Major League teams. Wow. <laughs> um, and by the end, you know, I, I felt a little bit like I was in the twilight of my career. I, I knew who I was. I knew my limitations. Uh, but in that last call-up that I ever received to the Major Leagues, uh, he went out of his way to tell me, uh, hey Varney, we had a closed door meeting. We had the opportunity to trade for an all-star, but instead all the coaches voted and unanimously decided to call you up instead of trading for this all-star. Wow. And I, it's the, I felt the same thing that you're describing of, I felt so valued. I felt so wanted, even though I didn't a hundred percent feel confident in my ability as much anymore. I felt confident that he felt confident and that gave that gave me the confidence uh, to go out there and play my best. So, uh, shout yeah. out to shout out to Terry Francona. Shout out to Brian McDermott. Uh, shout out to all leaders that make their their team and their team members feel valued. It it goes farther than you know. Um, Absolutely, and it's a, it's a skill. You know, the ability to to communicate in that way. I think it's it's probably understated you know so, so a, lot, a lot of managers i've had do not have that ability you know, not from a you know they're not bad people or anything like that it's just they don't have that ability to communicate and man manage to the level of some others and for me it's such an important skill you know in management is to instill confidence and in your players and, and show them faith and communicate with them and um yeah like i said you've got some that are really excellent at it yeah sure. very cool um so so now we have a cool opportunity uh, as we start to, to wind down the second uh, part of this podcast is I like to try to bridge the gap between the sports mindset, peak performance, uh, and peak performance in the real world, in the business world. And you are doing that at the same time as you're still a current professional soccer player, football player, sorry. Um, you have started a investment platform uh, for elite professional athletes in private markets uh it could be considered angel investing it could be considered a venture capital fund that's actually how we first got connected was you were asking if i would like to be involved uh which i'm excited um to get involved with as you come to the u.s talk to me about how you're taking your secrets to success from the pitch to the boardroom or to to investments yeah so again surrounding yourself with good people going going back to that um, sentiment at the, the beginning of the uh, conversation. I went to university pre pre professional sport. Um, kept very much in touch with a lot of my close colleagues and friends from from university who've gone on to do amazing things. Entrepreneurs who've uh, built businesses, sold businesses. Um, so I've kind of locked locked minds with them, um, and, and four of us came up with with SQL. So yeah, we we launched. Um, a little under a year ago, um, it's a, like like you just said, an investment platform for elite athletes uh, to invest in private markets, particularly startups. Um, so it's a, a, a sort of new uh, market in the UK or a new idea to sports people in the UK, a lot more mature in the US. Um, we have about 150 athletes on the platform at the minute, predominantly, like I said, in the UK, launching in the US very soon. Um, and it, I'm really excited. I've, I've been angel investing like um myself for eight or nine years now maybe maybe even 10 years um and i really enjoyed it i did my mba alongside playing professional sport part-time for three years i really enjoyed that keep my sort of gray matter ticking over and you know keep myself a bit more mentally stimulated away from the pitch and i've always had a, a keen business mind so really excited um for for what we're doing and what we're building we i think we have a cool product um you know so we uh like i said we're bringing elite access to to deals uh for elite deal flow to, to professional sports people and we've got a real cool roster of players from the premier league to the nfl 
um so right across the board so it's 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 exciting and and like i said it's kind of i was going to ask you when you were winding down your career or in the twilight years did you approach games with an anxiousness that it was going to be over soon or with an excitement that it was not that it was going to be over soon but with an with a more carefree attitude because you knew it would be over soon if that makes sense how did you approach the back end of your career yeah so i i knew it was going to be the last season uh when i got traded when my daughter was nine days old and i had to move across the country um and through the move my wife who had just given birth ended up in the emergency room and i was like this this is just not sustainable uh for our family um what i remember about the last couple weeks of my career was a profound sense of gratitude is what it was yeah was I'm so grateful that I that I get to do this. I'm so grateful that I got to do this. Um, and I actually remember sitting in my locker. You know, I'm, I'm I'm tearing up even even telling the story right now. Sitting in my locker after my last game, and and tears just started streaming down my face. And you know, I was the oldest guy on this t- particular team by eight to ten years. It was a very young team, and everybody was like, "Are you okay? Are you okay?" Um, and I was okay because. I had done everything I wanted to do in the sport. I was, uh, I felt like I, I had fully lived out my dream, uh, and it just, I was, I felt overwhelmed. It was everything coming together all at once from the time I was five uh, to the time I went high school when I didn't feel good enough to the, you know, that meeting that I just told you where the the manager made me feel great. Everything all at once, uh, gratitude first, um, and it just all kind of hit me all at once. And I knew in that moment, I was like, this, this was it. And I, and I feel good yeah. with it. So, um, you didn't, you didn't ask for advice, but I, 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 I approached it with a, with a gratitude. Yeah, no, that's cool. It, it's, it's interesting because I've kind of never, I, I guess you don't, when you're a professional, you kind of think it lasts forever and there's this, you know, this is amazing, but in the UK, in, in football, for instance, if you reach 35, you've kind of, yeah. you've had a great innings, you know? So, uh, I am turning 35 very soon so you know it's um i know i know that the end is near and it, it is interesting you see a lot of my reasons not for starting sequel or for getting and do my mba it, it, a lot of it was born out of fear um you know the statistics for post sport make for some like pretty horrific reading here you know with alcoholism depression uh divorce bankruptcy that it, it's awful you yeah. know and i think a lot sh- a lot more should be done for um, professional sports people in retirement because clearly there's a, a fundamental disconnect, a fundamental problem. But I think uh, I had had a couple of friends that were a little bit further on the line than me. And I think a lot of my desire to spin plates early was born because I didn't want to be look like the way they're feeling. Do you know what I yeah. mean? I thought I've got to have my, my ducks in order, my eggs in order. And, and like I said, you know what what I'm creating. What I'm, it, it, it was that that was probably probably the, the initial motivation was to to start something cool and 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 leave the sport on my terms, if that makes sense, and yeah. try and retire on my terms and hope, like you say, come away exactly the way you did, where you thought I'm not scrambling around, thinking I need to find another contract and I'll do anything to. I want to kind of have that sense of gratitude and sit there exactly like you did and think. I had a great time. I achieved everything I wanted to achieve out of sport. It's the end. Do you know what I mean? But I've got something that I'm looking forward to. Yeah. Something that I, can, I have purpose for. And exactly like you said, and I hope I can have the same experience. Well, what a what a amazing timing to do this podcast and, and to hear where your head's at, seeing the end, uh, maybe not in your immediate future, but seeing it closer than the beginning certainly is how I like to think about it. The end is closer than the beginning. Uh, and just thank you for uh, sharing your mindset. So, so openly and honestly, Um, enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, just before I let you sign off, I always ask all my guests one, one question right at the end. And I say, if you could talk to a young Matt Smith and you could, because there's over 2 million of them, (laughs) <laughs> I could talk to a few, yeah. If you could talk to a, a young version of yourself uh, with your big hopes and dreams uh, and who doesn't have the talent yet or hasn't made it yet, what's the best advice that you've learned throughout your your career that you could share uh, with them? Well, that's a good question. That's a good question. I think that... I think the. 
I think the the early the early the young Matt Smith, like you said, probably when I think back to my early mindset and the kind of the way I was and the, my headspace being up and down, I probably would say this this too shall pass. You know, the the idea that the good times that's gonna that's gonna go at some point. You're gonna you're gonna be back down to to ground and the the bad times too. That's gonna pass. This doesn't last forever. You know, I always say tough um, tough times don't last. Tough people do, and it's kind of the 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 mindset I've always had is just be relentless block out external noise and just work as hard as you can you know i'm a big believer in kind of the one percent and i think i i kind of believe everyone's in the professional game because they're good they they have a talent they're skilled they they show excellence the the differentiators are the one percent the little tiny incremental things that make you look far better than the opponent but they're really just the one percent that you just plug away at day in day out so I would say to that, the young Matt Smith, I would just say, like you said, just plug away <laughs> the 1%, the little things that are going to make you a little bit better each day. And don't worry, tough times, will they'll pass. And those good times do enjoy them in the moment, but they'll they'll pass too. <laughs> it's not it's not all it's not all rainbow. So it's, um, yeah, a few bits of advice, maybe. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. And, and I could totally see it with, you know, everyone's in the game because they're good. That 1% is what separates you. And, and the 1% looks like way more than 1%. It's just those little, those little things. Yeah, absolutely. It's the paradox of effort, isn't it? The more effort you apply to something, the more, the more effortless it looks. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, like you said, those, those tiny 1% I've always just been a, a firm believer in. And I, I think I took that on board and maybe a, I wouldn't say a little bit too old per se, but I, if I'd have started them younger, you know, if I'd have maybe dived in a bit younger with that, maybe, who knows, maybe I could have had a, a better career. But yeah, that's probably the advice I would well, give any young at starting out. Yeah, well, you've had a, a tremendous career again. Congratulations. Congratulations on the startup with SQL. I'm very excited to see where it can go and potentially get involved. Uh, and thank you again for your time and, and your candor today. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you for listening. Uh, this has been Finding the Way, uh, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to Finding the Way with Ryan LaVarnway. Find previous episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.